Hey everyone, um, <clears throat> I've been meaning to do this for a while, but I've got a book, it's backwards to you, but it's Matilda, um, who is the same person that wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory that I read with my Pakiki. Um, this isn't compulsory, I will list which number it, it is in the sequence of the story so that people can listen to it along if they want to. You don't have to, just a bit of fun as I really love this story. And um, yeah, thought I'd get into reading a bit of a novel again. So, hope you enjoy it. We've got Matilda. Chapter one. The reader of books. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers, even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration they manage to convince themselves their child has qualities of genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with this. It's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us of the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us a basin, we're going to be sick. School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to the sort of twaddle from proud parents, but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorches for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure is not going to get a job anywhere else. Or, if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, It is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the sides of their abdominum. Abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learnt this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say the periodical cicada that spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of the sunlight and air. Your son Wilfred has spent six years as a grub in this school and we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying Fiona has the same glacial glacial beauty as an iceberg but unlike the iceberg she has absolutely nothing below the surface I think I might enjoy writing end of term reports for the stinkers in my class but enough of that we have to get on seems a bit mean I promise that we don't write things like that about you or do we <laughs> occasionally one comes across parents who take the opposite line who show no interest in at all in their children and these of course are far worse than the doting ones mr and mrs wormwood were two such parents they had a son called michael and a daughter called matilda and the parents looked upon matilda in particularly as nothing more than a scab a scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next country or even further than that. It is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they are scabs, they were scabs and bunions, but it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary, and by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr and Mrs Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was a perfectly normal boy. But the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should, have, should be seen and not heard. I don't really like her parents very much. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books. Hankering just means that she really wanted a lot of books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was, called, was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother. And when she read this from cover to cover and had learnt all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said, 
Do you think I, you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the tally, for heaven's sake? We've got a lovely tally with a 12-inch screen, and now you come asking for a book. You're getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. Mrs. Winwood was hooked on bingo and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, slightly taken aback by the arrival of such a tiny girl, unaccompanied by a parent, nevertheless told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on the lower shelves, Mrs. Phelps told her. Would you like me to help you find one with lots of nice pictures in it? No, thank you, said Matilda. I'm quite sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother had left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took only ten minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours of sitting quietly by herself in a cosy corner, devouring one book after another. When she had read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering around in search of something else. Mrs Phelps, who had been watching her in fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over to her. Can I help you, Matilda? she asked. I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I've finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at the pictures? Yes, but I've read the book as well. Mrs Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height and, Miss, and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind the closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? Four years and three months, Matilda said. This is a picture of Matilda and Mrs Phelps. Can you see how tiny Matilda is? And there's this big bookcase and then there's Mrs Phelps who looks like she's just trying to help her. But she's really little. Four years and three months. Mrs Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she had the sense not to show it. What sort of book would you like to read next, she asked. Matilda said, I would really like a good one that grown-ups read. A famous one. I don't know any names. Mrs Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance of the kind that is written for 14-year-old schoolgirls, but for some reason she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda, Matilda read by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Mrs Phelps told herself, but to Matilda she said, of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting for hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. It was necessary to rest it on the lap because it was too heavy for the child to hold, which meant she had to sit forward in, the, in order to read it. And a strange sight it was that this tiny dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Mrs Havisham, and her cobwebbed house, and by the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words. The only movement from the reader was the lifting of the hand every now and then to turn over the page, and Mrs Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, it's Ten to five, Matilda, which I think means it's closing time soon. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs Phelps had said to her, Does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to Aylesbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda had said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. Mm, 
I'd rather not. Sorry, my screen just went blank. Mm, I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what do they expect you do every afternoon in an empty house? Mm, just mooch around and watch the telly. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said a little sadly. Mrs Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village high street and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. Just to let you understand how much that is, this book is only 232 pages, and it will take us probably longer than a week to read. So Matilda read that book in such a quick amount of time. I loved it, she said to Mrs Phelps. Has Mr Dickens written, written any others? Oh, a great number, said the astonished Mrs Phelps. Shall I choose you another? Over the next six months, under Mrs Phelps' watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by, Dick, by Charles Dickens. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Just a wee fun fact. I've been in a production of Oliver Twist and I played a character called Nancy. And it was really great and I loved it a lot. It was in Rangura actually. Um, about six years ago. So that was fun. Um, she read Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, who's another really famous author. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Tales, uh, Tess of the Orbervilles. Dorbervilles, I didn't say that one right, by Thomas Hardy, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, and a lot more. It was a formidable list, and by now Mrs. Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement, but it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost everyone else, sorry, almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond. But not so, Mrs Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mr Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel I am right there on the spot watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that, Mrs Phelps said, and don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. I will, I will. Did you know, Mrs Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? I didn't know that, said Mat Matilda. Could I do it? Of course, said Mrs Phelps. When you have chosen the book you want, you bring it to me and I can make a note of it and it's yours for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. Here's another picture of Mrs Phelps and Matilda. Mrs Phelps is sitting on the chair helping her out. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room, and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. I don't know about you, but I love hot chocolate. She was not quite tall, en tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally she made bovril or... Ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading in the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her to new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived extraordinary lives. It went on olden day sailing she went on olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling. She travelled all over the world by sit while sitting in her little room in an English village. And here's Matilda sitting in her wee room with her hot chocolate beside her and her books there ready. So that is the end of chapter one. Chapter two is called Mr. Wormwood and the Great uh, Mr. Wormwood the Great Car Dealer. 
So I'll do a different video for that one so that you can watch it chapter by chapter. Um, yeah, I love this book. So I really hope that people listen and, and go along with me. Cool. Well, I'll see you for chapter two, team. Bye.